Welcome to a very special edition of the Bet on Her podcast. I'm your host, Dana Dramarian, and today we're going to come to you live in sunny San Diego. Joining me are two phenomenal guests, Jen Spiker and Logan Tom, key leaders in the Pro Volleyball Federation. This new, real professional women's volleyball league in the U.S. is not just a game changer, it's a dream come true for many. Today, we're going to dive into your journeys, the challenges you've faced, the triumphs you've celebrated, and the vision you hold for the future of women's volleyball. Really thrilled to have you on here. Why don't we start off with maybe both of you introducing yourselves to our listeners and just telling me what your role is at Pro Volleyball Federation. Sure. So good morning, Jen Spiker. Thank you so much, Dana, for having us. Of course. We're so excited to be here together to talk about Pro Volleyball Federation. Mm -hmm. Um, Jen Spiker, I'm the CEO of Pro Volleyball. Uh, I live and work out of the Gross Point Woods, Michigan area. Mm -hmm. I'm in the Columbus uh, League offices often and uh, currently just, you know, trying to get this league moving and up and running. Great. Wow, she's such a pro. I can't, <laughs> it's hard to follow her. I'm serious. Whenever I see her talk or do it, whenever, <laughs> even if it's like fun or she's just like on it. She's killing um, me. No, it's true. We aren't having any fun. It's the, <laughs> no, I really actually enjoy this role. So, hi, Logan. I knew Dina from, yes. yeah. Beach. Yes. yes. Um, I am the head of international development and player strategy. Um, so we're just kind of trying to figure out what that role is, but so far it's been fun. I supposedly can work remotely and from the States. Um, but right now I'm in the States, so I'm down here for San Diego, which has been a blast. And fortunately, I also have the opportunity to do this podcast with you and Jen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, so Jen, let's start with the, the beginning. What sparked the creation of the Pro Volleyball Federation League and what's the mission driving it? And how do you find yourself at the forefront of the journey of leading the charge? I find myself having to pinch myself every day <laughs> is what I find. Um, this all started with Dave Winham and Stephen Evans, our founders. Uh, they've had their eye on women's indoor professional volleyball for a dozen or so years. These two individuals um, have been in the professional sports and entertainment business for the last 24 years. Wow. Um, and so they bring um, what I would call concrete experience, not concept experience, when it comes to how to run a real professional league. And um, like I said, a couple of years ago, uh, the, they talked to three different um, executives from Big Ten Network, uh, one from ESPN and one from the Bally platform. Each of those executives on three separate occasions shared with Dave and Steven that women's indoor NCAA volleyball had risen to the third most viewed sport wow. in college. Yep. Um, that coupled with a couple of weeks later, um, Kathy DeBoer, who was at the time the ABCA chair, shared with Dave and Steven that, that there were more girls playing volleyball in the state of Texas than there are boys playing football in the states of Florida and Ohio combined. That's huge. It is very big, it is a very big deal. Yeah. And it was then that Dave and Steven set out to build this league. And as you can imagine, when you build a league, you start to identify your founding partners. Founding partners can come in a variety of ways. Staff people like Logan and myself, um, it can come in your uh, first teams and markets. It can come in brands like you know Gatorade and Powerade and Nike and and those, uh, those types of brands. But um, 35 years ago, I was playing volleyball at Wayne State University in Detroit. I was a middle blocker. And as part of my putting myself through school, I was also the secretary in the football office. And the defensive coordinator in the football office was Dave Winham. Oh, wow. And so Dave called me about 18 months ago. I had not spoken to him in 22 years. And he had watched my career. Uh, I've been in this human capital staffing industry for the last 30 years, uh, building large sales and delivery teams. Mm -hmm. And he picked the phone up and we talked and I met with Steven and he said, I want you to come run this league. And I said, uh, why me? And he said, why not? And I said, okay. And he goes, and your last name is Spiker. Yeah. So, How perfect is that? Yeah. yeah. And I've, uh, I made the leap. Uh, I left the industry that I'd uh, built my career in and, and it's just been amazing to be able to dream this big for these women and create this opportunity for them. Um, it's really special for me being a volleyball player, mm -hmm. uh, being a volleyball mom. Mm -hmm. I was a volleyball coach. Um, and I witnessed firsthand my best friend uh, left Wayne State University and went to Germany for three years. Yeah. And she would call me every night. And she was 
not happy and uh, you know dissatisfied with what she was doing and but for the love of the game step you know kept in it and so that's why this is so special for me yeah I mean that I mean, it sounds like it's it's fate really right my, my world's all collided yeah. for sure right my love of volleyball my love of the game my love of sports yeah. uh, my business experience my love of mentoring women in business mm -hmm. um, it, they all came cl colliding together and, and here I am Maybe uh, you and I can work together and you mentor me. Ah, nice. <laughs> would I would great. love that opportunity. Yeah, that would be great. Logan, you've brought on you've been brought on as the head of international development and player strategy with your storied career in volleyball. What drew you to this role and how are you applying your experience to this new challenge? Storied career, long career. Yes, <laughs> just pretty much as age as me, but it's okay. <laughs> Um, it actually happened at Carrie Walsh was the one that connected me and Jen. So as you know, me and Carrie had a stunt together trying to do the beach thing and it didn't work out. But like you said, everything happens for a reason. So it was in May, mm -hmm. actually my birthday. She sent me a, like a birthday message and Jen was there and she asked me if, um, it was okay if she connected me and Jen together and cause she knows I'm a very private person. So I'm like, don't get my number out. And I was like, I was like, I'll fucking kill you. Um, <laughs> so, so she was kind enough to ask me and I was like, yeah, no problem. Like conversation. I'm always up to conversations. And so Jen called me or I said, let's get together. Um, we got on a phone call and I was, I told Jen, we went over this yesterday. I was like, listen, I'm not exactly sure <laughs> what you want from me. So you're going to have to start this conversation. And where to go and her first question was like well do you want to play and i was like i'm good thank you i was like i was like even give my little body a rest um and then it just started from there yeah. it was uh she wanted me part of the league but she was very considerate of carrie um to if they wanted me on the san diego team at first that didn't work out and when it didn't work out jen um created this position that i can work for for the league and like put all my years and years of experience and try to help them grow when it comes to international level, when they need advice, when they need consulting, when it comes to specifically player wellness and coaches wellness too, um, as we're finding out um, how to make it as successful as possible. And also just be their kind of guiding light when it comes to international part, because they're, we have college coaches, you guys have never been in an international FIVB, stuff like that, when it comes to transfers, when it comes to foreign players or national players. So I'm just, there to help them where they need. Logan brings a wealth of knowledge, not only just of volleyball, of contacts and networks and people. And, um, you know, as long as she's comfortable with it, you know, we're going to utilize her to, you know, bring our game across over into Europe. Um, and she's the perfect person to do it. Um, so we're super excited to have her. Yep. And she's also leading and going to sit on the Players Council with me. Um, she's leading our health and wellness effort. I mean, I played volleyball a very, very long time ago, and I don't know the tools of, of the trade that are out there now. And so she's currently researching all kinds of different, um, you know, mind and, and you know, just health, health and wellness type of products, yeah. uh, apps that, that we can, you know, provide to the athletes so that they have a tool chest that when they need something, they can go in and it's there. Yeah, amazing. And for the record, um, you're an Olympian. That's I kind of a big deal. Uh, guess for so. for time Olympians, yes. you guys keep aging me. Sorry, two time what? silver medalist. Yes, oh, like <laughs> yeah, uh, we're in the presence of greatness. Yes, <laughs> yeah. When I was uh, when I was telling the the person here, I was like, you know, I'm setting up for these two amazing women. I was telling them your roles and stuff, and she was just like, wow. And I'm like, yeah. And I just like pinched myself because I I thought I remember watching you playing. I was watching you on television, and like now. I'm interviewing you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what a wild it's world. Funny. Life like, is funny. Yeah. And out. then like when you were when you were practicing with with Carrie on the beach, I, I just want to say for the record, you still have an arm. I, <laughs> OK, you can still move. I bet you can still play with the best of them. OK, she, she can. They, I, it, it's tempting, to be honest, but I'm really happy where my life is going right now. I'm really, really enjoy the role I have with um, this federation. Yeah. Volleyball federation. Well, you know, that's yeah. a backup. It's like we have a whiteboard and we're writing on yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. It's creating. It's yeah. fun. Being creative is fun, as you know. Yeah. Good job. I love that. Yeah. Now, challenges are inevitable in any venture. Jen, can you elaborate on some of the obstacles the league has faced in its inception and how you navigated them? Sure. So there's probably three areas that I, I, I would talk to you about. The first is the volleyball community is very skeptical. Yeah. And um, I understand, right? There's been other leagues 
that have been tried and failed. And, and I can only tell you that those leagues were all had one thing in common, and that's that they were all owned by the same individual or mm. entity. Yeah. And that's not how we're doing it. You know, each of our teams is owned by a separate investment group. Um, the league will police and, and, you know, create the rules and be make sure that the teams are compliant. Um, but the teams are allowed to make their own decisions in their markets with, you know, ticket sales and, you know, people that they want to bring in and, and, and the like and, and with the rosters. And so um, I think that's the first thing was just the skepticism that is even still out there um, with so many uh, volleyball community uh, people. Um, the second, I think, would be the timing of us coming out and our ability to create uh, contracts while the women were already getting contracts in Europe. Interesting. So I started, um, I, I hired four or five player relations associates back in, uh, I think it was October, uh, November of last year. And we went to, went to work. Um, we identified the top 500 players, American players playing in Europe. Uh, there were 320 at the time that had visas. And then we knew there was a number of, of other women that were here or playing in Puerto Rico or playing in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And so um, we identified those those ladies and then we literally divided and conquered. And um, each of my player reps as a, is a different kind of age, right? Uh, they range from the age of 22 to, to 28. And mm -hmm. so we were able to really, you know, dig in and um, we probably had over a thousand phone calls. Wow. Um, and it was really a grassroots mm -hmm. one player at a time conversation because the players were skeptical. Yeah. And so you had to really explain why we were different. And um, we've signed 94 players to date for seven teams. So as you can imagine, we, yeah. it was pretty easy to, to overcome uh, some of those uh, obstacles. And then I think the last thing and, and the thing that still, you know, is just a little bit of a conflict is we are bucking up on, on an Olympic year. And there's a number of women that will play mm -hmm. uh, for us this year. I think there's 11 or 12 that are also uh, invited to the national team gym. And um, we realize that that's a conflict and we're gonna let those women, and, and not even just the United States, but we have some international uh, players. Um, as you know, there's two international players allowed per roster mm -hmm. and we have some international players that are gonna have to go to their national team gyms and we want them to. You know, the best thing that, that the Olympics could provide the United States is, yeah. a, is a volleyball gold medal for the for the ladies so Absolutely. and the men. Yeah, uh, it'll be great for our sport. It'll be great for our league. And so those players are going to be released to go to their national gym whenever they need to. Mm -hmm. um, that's the right thing to do. And, and we're always going to do the right thing. Yeah. Amazing. What do you think about the international stage? When it comes to the professional volleyball federation? Yes. Um, I think it's the same, like people have been skeptical from a domestic point and also from an international point, just because there have been like trials and failures when it comes to developing a professional league in the States. But like Jen said, they're coming from a very different platform, which is m what simulates more the professional leagues internationally and also the ones domestically. So I think separating out to different franchises with the teams is a huge, huge, like head start to having it succeed. Um, and it's just going to be the proof is in the pudding. So when the, the league is coming, they already have so many different steps for the athletes when it comes to the comfort level, their salaries, what they're providing them, everything from um, the basics to the psychological, to the mental, to the emotional, to the nutritional, um, which is like leaps above any other professional league when it comes domestically or internationally for women's volleyball. So I think once they see it and they, they see that it's what's happening um, and it gets started, that people are going to understand this. It's something real. It's something real and it's going to be good for the athletes and it's good for like the international volleyball stage in general. Um, I think it's going to take a little, because right now there's, so you have to understand like most of the American players, they don't, not most, all American players, they didn't have a choice but to play internationally if they wanted to play professional volleyball afterwards. So there's a huge pool for the national volleyball teams to have. It's just, just Amer it's just like, like, plucking little tadpoles out of a pool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, you want here, you want here, you want here because they have no choice. Now they have a choice. Yeah. And they have a good, good option choice in the States. So it's going to take like that, that huge pool that came internationally. It's, it's going to be feeling a lot domestically in the States right now. So I think there's going to be it's the, like, they really feel it. Like I think a lot of agents and teams are going to understand, like they're not going to have the American pool they're used to. So that's going to take a little bit of time. Um, for things to adjust when you talk about international stage. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I remember uh, when I first met you in uh, Coronado, we were there for the signing ceremony. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting there and then the, uh, watching it all on food. And then the next day we were doing a bunch of interviews and I was following along documenting with my camera. And I just thought to myself, these guys are serious. Oh yeah. They're moving fast. Yeah. And just hearing um, how coordinated it all was is just eye opening because I'm hearing about all the other leagues and how slowly they're moving and their contracts are very limiting and constraining to some of the athletes. They're locked in and there's no revenue stream and that sort of thing. And that's why, again, a lot of the athletes end up going to Italy because that's the best league in the world right now. Right. Yep. Until real pro volleyball federation comes along and they're like, not anymore. Yep. And I can see, I mean, all of these young women coming back, how many, I think I, we spoke to, um, Jordan Larson, she came onto my podcast and asked her about it as well. She's like, it's amazing what, what we're building here in the U.S. There's finally going to be multiple leagues. And I was telling her about Pro Volleyball Federation. And I'm like, do you realize what an advantage it is to play with these guys versus everybody else? I mean, I'm not going to, nothing against any other league. I just think that people that take it more seriously and are looking at it at a more holistic approach is better for everyone involved because mm -hmm. I think that you know at the end of the day you're taking care of your athletes you're taking care of the program and you're building the community around it yeah. each of them with you know each franchise and le leadership I think so yeah I, I mean hats off to you guys what you're building is is big it's big big you know and it's not like something that's rolling out slowly because you know some of the leagues are starting out like later I think it is because your season starts February 2024 our first match is January 24th there you go 2024 I mean, even 11 sooner. weeks away yeah yeah you mentioned a couple of things that you know we are all about the economic viability um the fairness to the athletes and mm -hmm. fairness um to the league and and the quality of the product yeah um and I don't know if you know this Dana but the way our professional athletes are treated is the utmost importance to us um, we have very strict rules on, you know, um, the way they travel, the, the hotels that they can stay in. Um, even even our apparel company, when we chose our apparel company, mm -hmm. we took seven athletes with us and we trotted around to different apparel companies and we tried things on because we want this to be about them. And um, they literally, a couple of them got their mini camp gear and I'm getting texts like, these leggings are so soft and this spandex is so awesome. And um, so it's exciting to to kind of hear them now when everything's coming to fruition and, yeah. and how excited they are. The other thing I wanted to mention is we're gonna be the first league that I'm aware of in the in world that is going to generate revenue and share that revenue with the athletes. Yeah. Um, revenue that comes from media and broadcasting deals as well as expansion teams. Um, that's a big deal. No one does that. And uh, nobody does it. And those athletes are our product. They mm -hmm. are, you know, our league. And why shouldn't they share in in the joy, but also in the revenue of the league? Yeah. And so they're going to. Yeah, they're your brand ambassadors. That's right. Yeah, I agree. You want to add anything? No, it's just a, it's, it's just a different world for me. So I grew up very old school. So it's like uh, you just work and then you're just great for whatever you get. So I'm, I'm torn be like, between being like, yes, obviously give these athletes what they deserve, but I'm like, also don't spoil them kind of thing. So, but they're going in a way where I think how they're doing it is fair on both sides because I don't, especially now when it comes to like colleges and stuff like that, it's a very different world than how I grew up. Very different world than what I grew up when I start, first started playing professionally or, you know, mm -hmm. um, overseas. So I'm very used to like putting your head down and, just getting your shit done. Grinding yeah. through. Yeah. We yeah. didn't have the chance to go into a we portal. We, we, we signed a college deal and that was our coach for the next four it, years. Yeah. But that, yeah, we didn't have a choice to like transfer yeah. this and that, but I also think it, it like, I, I also enjoy that part of it because I think it helped help me grow into the person Absolutely. I am. So, Working through a yeah, challenging. The adversity. Yep. And so I also still want to put that in front of athletes today because I think it's very important. I think it's something that's kind of been taken away from athletes and, and children and to help them grow and to become the adult they need to be to be the people that lead us through whatever next generation. So I think it's like a tit for tat kind of thing yep. um, where for me, just I just want to make sure that like there's still a line there where they're just not given everything with a silver spoon. They still have to work for it. kind of Yeah, thing. yeah, I get that. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I used to play indoor volleyball. I was a libero. I was a, I was a setter as well. 
and yeah you just you grind yeah that's what you do but and I, think, I love the grind yeah like that was that's one of builds my, character yeah absolutely thank yeah, you yeah i agree and i think the the rev share i'm that's huge it's going to support them financially for sure yeah. i mean yeah. especially like today with the prices going up and the yeah. economy are you kidding and all me? that. Like, yeah, oh. absolutely. Yeah. When it comes to recruiting, how are you identifying identifying and attracting top talent to join the brand new league? And is the talent strategy a mix of domestic and international? Which yes, it already is. But Yeah, it is. So every every team has two international players. Mm -hmm. Um it's the international players right now it's just been a little difficult because they've got it started late. So a lot of players have signed. So it's and I think there's maybe I I know Columbus is looking for international players. San Diego, last time I checked, was, but most of the rosters are filled. There's seven teams right now. I'm there as a consultant for the coaches. They come to me and ask for international players, and I'll give them what's available still. There's also, you have to understand, international. They always have cuts when it comes to the European leagues when it ends in December, and the league doesn't start until January. So there's still, and I tell them all the time, I'm like, listen, you have this pool right now. Teams will cut international players when it comes to December, and the, and, if they don't make it past a certain level and they just want to, they need to get rid of them just for salary, salary mm -hmm. points or looking for something different or they are, don't enjoy them, whatever, whatever the reason is. So there's going to be another opening when it comes to December before the league starts. So that's, that's the international stage. Next year will be different because you're going to start much earlier. So they're going to typically teams internationally start getting their players in January, February, starting the season before. So, and that just comes with coaches and recruiting and stuff like that. And if they want me to go out and recruit international players, because typically I'm supposed to be based overseas in Israel, um, they can send me to whatever, France, Italy, Germany. So they don't have to send somebody from the States over there since I'm based, you know, yeah. the city is closer. Um, as for domestic players, we have the draft, mm -hmm. which is coming oh, in yeah. December. Yeah. Um, and we just got out an email to the top 50 college um, schools about potential draftees that don't have any more eligibility left after the season finishes and if they're interested to be part of the draft for the professional volleyball uh, federation so and i know like coaches are emailing you yeah yeah, yeah. coaches are emailing me with their what, what they're calling super seniors no good seniors, yeah. seniors six yeah. seven year seniors yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> et cetera et cetera um, but also the players they don't understand the actual rules to the draft so, so i've talked to players individually and they're like wait they're like, if I don't go, if I don't join the professional volleyball federation right now, I'm like, can I join it later? I'm like, of course you can. Yeah. I'm like, the draft, the draft is just for seniors without eligibility left. Yep. After that, then you're just a normal professional player. How how it works in in Italy and Turkey, how it works with any professional league in the states. So they're just they just don't have the information out there because they're not used to it. So as the time goes on and they see what's happening, it's going to be more become more clear. Yeah, I think it's a great option. I, I was over at uh, Big Ten Media Day for Volleyball World, and a lot of the athletes that we were interviewing, many of them were, were graduating mm -hmm. or, you know, COVID seniors, you know, super seniors. And of several of them, I would say 90% of them didn't know what they wanted to do beyond the sport, yep. beyond their, you know, their years in college and university. And this is a fantastic option. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them, I think, are having a hard time identifying who they are outside of the sport and i think that's something maybe many universities should focus on you know helping develop the human behind the athlete because it's also student athlete right sure yeah. but at the end of the day you know there are those that are extremely passionate about the sport they love the sport love playing it it's in their dna but yeah i mean a lot of those big 10 athletes were like i think I'm telling you, I could probably go back and look at my footage. Several of them were like, I think I'm going to go, you know, to Europe. Yeah. yeah. And during the interview itself, I couldn't say, hey, go to Pro Volleyball Federation because I would have done that. Well, and, you and know, next year is going to look a lot different. Um, as you can imagine, this is the first year for our league. So um, next year we already have three teams announced or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Dallas and Kansas City and then one more to come. Uh, we have another team on the Eastern Seaboard signed. Um, we absolutely believe we're going to get to 12, yeah. if not 14. Uh, but if you get to 12 teams, that's five expansion teams after one year. Yeah. That's another 50 yeah. veteran professional players yeah. that we need. And, you know, we've got we've got the list of 100 and X amount that are over and currently playing in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I would tell you 60 of them have called me and said, I'm playing with you in 2025. Yeah. And that's terrific. Um, you know, so, so the, the way 2025 is going to, it's going to look a lot different than 2024 yeah. and we're excited about that. You know, we want our season to go longer. 
um, you know, start earlier in January and go later in, in May. Um, and, you know, the fact that these women are playing for a championship mm -hmm. and they are going to split a million dollars if they win it. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. And well, you get it, to be at home. And there's prize money for MVP of the league. There's there prize money for playoff MVP. There's a, um, a prize money for every position player of the year, mm. uh, setter of the year, outside hitter of the year, opposite of the year. Um, so we've got a lot of, of things going on in our league that these ladies are going to get excited about and going to play for. Yeah. In terms of the business side, what strategies are you employing to ensure the league's financial stability, sustainability, and growth? Well, I think we talked about it. Each of the teams is owned by a separate investment group. Mm -hmm. And there's a very rigid application process. Uh, first of all, there's a an application fee. And um, that fee um, would, would certainly scare anybody off that doesn't have the investment dollars to really, you know, put into this. Um, you know, when you look at the amount of money the league has raised, you know, we're talking about each ownership group has, has committed to a three-year commitment. Yeah. You know, we're talking about, you know, 20 to, to $25 million per team um, that's committed to this league. That's, a, that's times seven, right? So that's the economic viability. Um, making sure the fairness is there, making sure that we're doing things the right way. Mm -hmm. You know, um, somebody said to me, oh, are you, are you working with FIVB? Of course we are. You know, why wouldn't we work with FIVB? And yes, we're going to follow the rules of FIVB. We're going to walk through the front door every time and we're going to do it right every time because that's the way we're going to succeed. I'm going to put that in a quote. We're going to walk through the front door. Absolutely. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. We were not going to, you know, go through a maze here. We're just going straight for that door. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, FIVB rules says we have to release the national team players when they do, and we're going to release them, you know, and the coaches are, are dealing with that, you know, they're dealing with, oh my gosh, I might lose Morgan Hens in mid-April. She's my number one bro. Well, okay. You know, our product is still going to be fantastic. Which I, I would that. say that's, that's big when it comes to putting pressure, like releasing pressure off players. Yeah. Like I don't know many teams that would be willing to release players before, especially at the end of the season, if they're going into the finals. Yeah, you just have to, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. You know, we want, we want them to win an Olympics. Yeah. So bring home, bring home the gold, bring home the gold. <laughs> what are your thoughts on uh, VNL volleyball nations league? A lot of the athletes, they think it's very taxing on their bodies because it ends up starting at the end of one of their seasons. Yeah. So I, you're asking the wrong person. I mean, <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, whatever they do today, it was nothing compared to what I did when I were playing or like, like my teammates, yeah, we had something different. We had yeah. the grand prix and that was the same kind of thing. It was like, uh, like a month. Um, we went, I mean, I think we maybe had two or three days where we go straight to the national team gym after our season, depending where you play like European seasons are longer than Asian seasons. So uh, everything depends, but we never had a break. Um, so I'm, like I said, I come from a different mindset. Um, I'm like, you get, you get a week. I'm like, I was like, I'm like, that's like spa. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like, like, I'm not like, I'm not used to that. Um, like I said, I think it's it, like, there's like, we went extreme one way. I just don't want to see go to the extreme way, extreme the other way. Yeah. So I think there's a balance. Um, every athlete is different. Yeah. Um, we didn't really have a choice when I was playing. If you didn't kind of do it and go to the grind and make the cut that you're just out. So it also filtered like the more like, I, I want to say mentally strong, you know, from like not the weaker ones, but the ones that just were like, no, I don't want this because it was a huge sacrifice. Um, but it, you, you also see like the different personalities now than you did before. Like right now, I think it's like they, you can see it like for us, like we found the joy in the grind and like the sacrifice and we didn't smile a lot. We just wanted to fucking sweat and bleed. Now it's more kind of like cheer, cheer, pat, pat, smile, smile. And I was just like, that was never, it was never like that when I played. Um, I personally, I enjoy the grind rather than the hurrahs. Um, but there's players right now that they do well with the hurrahs more than the grind. So it just depends on what kind of environment you want to create. And what about the fans? How are you planning to enhance the fan experience both in the arena and at home? Uh, we are talking to most, if not all, of the brass, uh, national broadcast companies. Uh, we're in those media conversations now. Um, we plan on having three national broadcasts a week, wow. uh, 84 matches. Um, and then the teams that aren't on a national broadcast are responsible for their own local um, their own local partnerships with, with TV stations. We're going to have a streaming partner, mm -hmm. um, so they'll be able to stream uh, all the games. Uh, the fan experience, I mean, it's, it's going to be something special. Uh, we're not talking NCAA-type fan experience. Um, we just went out and... Um, procured 
one of the most significant, uh, what I would call replay and challenge systems out there. Um, so we are going to have, I think it's 22 cameras, um, you know, 10 on the floor and, and 12 on the, on the, in the ceiling. Um, you know, it, it, the fans are going to be able to cheer. They're going to be able to have noisemakers, mm -hmm. right? We're going to create, um, there's some teams that are creating fan zones at the end of the uh, behind the service line, mm -hmm. you know, uh, where there's, you know, cocktail tables and banquet tables and watch your drink because the serve's coming. <laughs> uh, watch your head because the serve's coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's going to be a, a unique uh, sport and uh, to watch. And, and uh, you know, volleyball is one of those sports that doesn't need a whole lot of help. Yeah. It's a female women's volleyball is probably the only sport that I can think of that in no way, shape or form takes a backseat to the men's version. It's actually probably a more fun product to watch. It's yeah. a little bit, a little bit slower um, and certainly fascinating with all the rallies that are going on. And so I don't, I, I, I don't see the fans, you know, m being channel servers when it comes to professional volleyball. Yeah, I love it. I'm excited. I'm excited for the indoor scene to happen, just the excitement around it, the energy, just just everything about it. I think women's game is more like like chess versus like. Funny. No, oh, did you say the same thing? No, um, please. No, we're, we're doing share. a we're, for sure. We're doing a presentation for the ABCA, and it's, it's part of it is like a kind of a play on a chessboard. Oh, so yeah. it's similar, like defense, yeah. offense, offense, defense. Yeah, and everything yeah. Not together. to say that it's not exciting because it is exciting. At least on the beach side, it's much slower yep. right the indoor side completely different scene mm -hmm. so I, I yeah i'm really excited about this this opportunity yeah i think morgan hent said it best with every single point something really cool happens yes yeah and in the blink of an eye you could miss it yep that's so right you, you got to keep your eyes peeled yep, yep. <laughs> so for both of you what does uh success look like for the pearl volleyball federation league um i for me, I think the the main pool for me to come be a part of this professional volleyball league was just to have some kind of hand in bringing volleyball back to the states. And so for me, it's all about the players. It's about their opportunities. Um, obviously, I love volleyball. I've been doing it for years. Um, and I think it's always strange because everybody asks me when I've been overseas for 20 plus years, like, why doesn't the states have like professional volleyball league? And I'm like... I was like, it's been tried, it's been done. I'm like, they're just doing it the wrong way. And so when Jen came towards me and I was like, I knew I knew there was like um, different volleyball leagues trying to get out there as well. But when she came, came to me with what they wanted to do and how they wanted to create it, I was like, oh, this actually has potential to work. I'm like this, because it's been what I've been telling everybody overseas. I'm like, I'm like, because they're not doing it the right way in the right places, the right structure. I was like, I'm like, I don't understand. They're coming with one huge sponsor. They can't finance all that is impossible. Um, so when they came out, when she came to me with the league or the federation and I was like, oh, I'm like, okay, this, I can actually like be part of creating this environment for future environments. And that to me is, for me personally, is the most exciting part. Yeah. Um, not only to be a part of it, but to put just the initial steps um, and also be able to do with the people around the Federation, which yeah. are amazing people. For me, this will be the premier women's sports league in North America, period. And we will know that we have made it when each one of our women are making seven plus figures, whether it's through salaries, um, bonus money, sponsorships, ads, you know, that's our goal. Yeah. I mean, it's also, it's, it's lofty, but that's our goal. It's yeah. And it's, it's so <laughs> inspiring. It's inspiring to me hearing this and watching it happen from literally it's, it's birth really. And also the younger generation, Yeah, <laughs> birth. the birth, <laughs> just the younger generation too, is just how inspiring it is to to see a lot of these athletes. Well, that's another thing, just having the role models out there for these girls, because I, I think it's really lacking, or has been. Yeah. I think it's growing right now, but the role models I have aren't the kind of role models that I typically would, if I had a child, would want my daughter to follow. Mm -hmm. So just that creation as well. Um, strong, beautiful, athletic women. Um, smart. Smart. Mm -hmm. uh, that just, it's like outside of whatever this TikTok generation or materialistic generation, I'm sorry, I'm just not a fan of it. Um, yeah. But but no, just have real women, yeah. like real, actual, tangible women that they can go and see um, and that have a voice and have an opinion. 
Yeah. And they, they look real, they act real, they talk to you real. Um, I think it's really important, especially right now when we're seeing this just like the switch in the generation right now, like we, we need the, the, the counterweight to it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something huge that can be just such a big turning point too. Yeah. As we near the end of our time, I'd love to pose, um, to both of you, two questions, one personal, um, and one, and then one about impact. So how do you take a bet on yourself or how have you taken a bet on yourself and how is this taking a bet on women in sports? For me, I took a bet on myself when I took the role. Yeah. I mean, I was sitting in an industry where I had climbed the ladder. I was the chief revenue officer of a, of a global company. I was doing just fine. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm the major breadwinner. My husband, uh, God bless him, stayed home and took care of our phenomenal children and raised them. And they are two very bright articulate, intelligent individuals. And I traveled the world and, and sold for many, many years. Um, leaving that industry was a big jump. Yeah. It was a big risk. This is a startup, period, yeah. right? There is no net. Um, I could always go back to the industry, but boy, I'm having so much fun. I don't really <laughs> want to. So I think that's um, my entire career. I've taken a bet every time I've made a move. And this was just another opportunity. And um, to make this difference and this impact for the women um, that we're bringing this product to, mm -hmm. for, for me and for our league, for the founders and for everybody that I work with on a daily basis is just, you know, really huge for us. Mm -hmm. uh, very similar. I think most of my career has been a bet. I switched teams mm -hmm. every year for the most part until I got to Israel. And that's just how I like to live my life. And this was also a bet too. I didn't know this was in the making. Um, until it actually happened and it's it's not like people people a lot of people enjoy the comfort in life a lot of times I enjoy the uncomfort and to see where life kind of takes me and right now it's taking me here um and so it's just been how I've led my life pretty much since my career happened well thank you for sharing that thank you guys for being here thank you yeah, for having us yeah this is amazing this is a blast um, hopefully uh, don't you have more questions no, I think that's it. I think that's it. Yeah. Oh I'm, my gosh! Did you just say that? Company. I know. I never do. Wait, podcasts. I need to. I don't. Camera. Delete. Camera. Get that. Delete. Just get camera. That. I'm gonna send it to Carrie. Delete. She texted me and she said, "Make her laugh." <laughs> there you go. And I'm gonna send it to her. I'm gonna cut this clip uh, specifically for her. But I just like I feel like I could sit down and talk to you guys forever. Yeah, this was amazing. Thank you for your time. Thank you.